Good evening and welcome to Empower You. I'm Betty Overstreet, the Executive Director, and it's good to see our, we're just almost full here. That's really great. Um, just want to let you know a few things before we get started. We're going to be giving away awards tonight, so we've allowed some time for that. Empower You was founded by Dan Reganall, and you know, Dan is the one that really, he's really drives this because it's his passion to educate you and have you enjoy it and um, become empowered, mostly to become empowered on subjects that you don't know anything about so that you can have conversations with people on the same things. So we are a free university powered only by donations. So towards the end of our program, we will pass around our little red buckets for any of those here that are new and don't know that. Uh, any donation that you would like to give towards the classes that we do, any amount is very much appreciated. We also uh, like to get your feedback on our classes. We also like to get suggestions for future classes. Some of our classes come as a result of you giving us ideas of what to look into. You can go to empoweruohio.org and leave your feed, uh, feedback, good, bad, or ugly, whatever it is, just to let us know where we can improve and leave your suggestions for classes. Also, um, our speaker tonight will be taking questions during his presentation. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, wait for one of us to bring the microphone to you so that everyone in the room, as well as the people online, can hear your question. And then I, now I'd like to tell you just about a few classes coming up. Next Tuesday, we're gonna have uh, bankrupt pensions and bailout. Rachel Gessler is gonna be here from the Heritage Foundation, and she's gonna be talking about, I don't know if you know this, I didn't know this because it doesn't involve me, but um, the unions and these companies that didn't prepare properly for the pensions don't have the money to fund them, and they'd like for you and I to bail them out. And so that's kind of what they've, are going to Congress for. She's going to be talking about that. So if that involves you specifically, if you're one of those people, you'll probably want to come and hear that. Then next Thursday, we're going to have Sean Maloney here talking about uh, DeWine's proposed gun laws that he's talking about. He's been on the news recently talking about changes, things he wants to do. For those of you that listen to Brian Thomas on 55KRC, He's going to be interviewing Sean at seven o'clock tomorrow morning. So you might want to tune in and hear him, but that would be a great class to come to also. And um, I just want to personally, and I know all of you do too, want to welcome Dan back. He wasn't here last week. I really missed him <laughs> and I'm sure you did too. So Dan, if you'd please come up. Test, test. Gosh. Thank you, Betty. That was so so nice of you to say that. And uh, it's um, true. <laughs> what you guys are you guys are a sight for sore eyes. It's so good to see so many good people here tonight. And uh, poor Carl up there. He even came back. And uh, we had a little <laughs> um, excitement at Frame USA and Empower You over the summer. Um, we were putting a new roof on this big building, and they they were running behind. You know how people do. And we had about a quarter of the whole building, the roof was exposed, there were 30 guys up there. It started to rain for an hour and a half and $200,000 later, um, we're still in a world of hurt upstairs in our offices. And poor Carl, I understand, got hit by a rain, uh, a drop from the, where they put a screw in the ceiling and I'm glad you decided to come back, sir, thank you. Uh, so a lot's gone on this summer. I wanted to start the evening off by having the voice of Empower You, Don Hurd, sing the Star Spangled Banner for us. Would you guys give Don a round of applause? Please stand, if you're able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light 
What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave? For the land of the free and the home of the brave. So we're starting our 18th season of Empower You. Um, we're looking forward to another great series of classes we have. The one with the Heritage Foundation Tuesday night, that's a big group that's coming to empower you. I hope you'll all come out and see them. They've never been here before, um, a national organization. But we've got just a, a very simple agenda for empower you, free classes, watch from home or here. Um, and all the classes are meant to do three things, educate, empower, educate, enjoy, and engage. And um, I ran across a guy, Jill, who's our uh, operations manager back there, she's hiding, brought me up a check to sign today, and it was from our first speaker last year. It's a guy by the name of Cam Harding. This is an empowered guy. I wanted to show you a picture of him for those of you who were here last year. It's that guy right there. Were any of you here when he spoke at Empower You the first session of last year? This is Cam Harding. This is a guy in, 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 Met, in, in Hamilton County that is totally as one person um, made a decision what he wants to do with Metro Transit in Hamilton County. And on his own back, he has, um, that's how the inquiry always changes things, but he's, he's been able to get the commissioners to sign onto a plan to increase the sales tax eight tenths of 1%. Um, the reason I bring that to you is that um, he's just an example of what uh, an individual citizen who's got something in mind that they want to do can do in a, in a period of, how many months has it been since we had our first session? February. So in eight months, he's decided that um, what we're going to do with Metro in, in the whole Hamilton County area. And it sounds great to provide great busing and new buses for everybody and more routes and more times and all that until you see something like the article that I passed out to you. Uh, when you see that these great ideas, sometimes they're good, sometimes they aren't. This is a $55 million building that you all built, um, the federal government built, that's never been used. Um, it was meant because without a doubt, we were going to light rail throughout the entire region and it never happened. And the first big problem was they didn't build the roof tall enough. Uh, just a simple little problem. And, um, but I think we'll be talking about Metro, hopefully this semester, if not this semester, next semester. A lot of things on our mind. We're gonna have a cool little class on um, let me see what the date is on, um, um, see. on November 6th, we're going to do a kind of a Ted talk. I see a lot of guys out there who email me with their great ideas. This is your chance to come up for 15 minutes, six people and talk about an idea you've got. There's a brochure about it right here. We're doing auditions here on October 16th. I'd love to hear what you have to say in 15 minutes. Uh, and I know many of you have things that are on your mind. Uh, so that'll be November the 6th and the audition session, there are two. The first one is October 16th. I wanted to introduce our team. We've got Bill Roll back there, our treasurer. Let's give him a round of applause, please. Jill is back there. Jill came in, Jill Google, our operations manager. Jay Grenke, our producer. And Betty Overstreet, our executive director. So we have a few awards we want to give out tonight. They're very important. They're Empowered Citizen Awards. These are people that attended 12 sessions over the last two semesters. I know she's here tonight, Pam Clark. 
all the way in the back. Let's give Pam a round of applause. Congratulations. Uh, are David and Karen, I don't think they're here tonight. David and Karen Cartier, they're not here. How about Gloria Tash? Gloria, congratulations to you, thank you. The voice of Empower You, Don Hurd. Thank you, sir. Jude and Mel DeWitt, right here. Thank you, congratulations. Mr. Jay Janis. Is Nancy Brown here tonight? Nancy, congratulations, here we go. Is Pauline Moeller here tonight? Not here? Wow, a lot. Right in the front row, Donna and Robert Knopp. Congratulations, way to go. How about Jerry Anders, is he here tonight? Jerry, congratulations. And how about Barbara and Gary Horowitz? Not here tonight. And I know Diane Landy's here tonight. Congratulations to our empowered citizens from last semester. Thank you. I'll expect each of you to have a TED Talk present presentation ready. Um, Charlene, I don't think Charlene's here. So we've got a giveaway, and then we've got a great speaker. So I'm going to ask our speaker to draw a number. And that number ends in 079. 079. Grab, oh, one of our empowered citizens. Uh, Donna Knopp, we've got a cold case DVD for you to be inspired after you listen to our speaker. Have fun. Ready? Okay, I'm with the moment you've all been waiting for, our speaker. John Newsom is a retired law enforcement officer, retiring after 26 years with the Cincinnati Police Department. He went to the Warren County Sheriff's Office for 14 years, retired as chief deputy. In his career, he held a number of assignments, most notably 12 years as a team leader with the CPD SWAT unit and a homicide unit supervisor. He was also assigned to internal investigations, training, planning and research, and tactical planning. At the sheriff's office, he headed up a cold case team that closed three major cold case murders. He is a graduate of both University of Cincinnati, BS, and Xavier University, MBA, he was an executive board member of, of the FBI Regional Terrorism Task Force. He has taught homicide and cold case investigations all over, all over the country. In his retirement, he privately consults with public safety and private sector organizations on personal matters. Please welcome John Newsom. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Hearing that Vitae, it sounds like I couldn't hold a job. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, when I used to teach this class, I taught it all over the country for the Justice Department back in the uh, 28, 2010. And then when I became chief, I didn't have time to do it anymore. So it was originally 16 hours for law enforcement. And we've cut that down now to eight. And now tonight, I cut it down to an hour and a half. So um, I'm used to teaching. If you have any questions, stop me at any time. It doesn't bother me. Uh, I won't be able to answer questions if you know of a particular specific case, because it wouldn't be fair to those investigators that have looked at that case, because I, I would have opinions based upon nothing but what you're telling me. So if you have a general question about what I'm talking about tonight, please feel free. You know, I, I even hesitate to say questions because I had, I presented to a group that was an advocacy group for uh, 
murdered family members about 10 years ago. And a lady come up to me after the class, and this was an enormous convention in a big hotel. And she said, would you mind taking a look? My brother was killed, out, he was out of town. And um, we never think the, we never thought the uh, investigators did a very good job of the case. And I said, yeah, if you've got some things, you know, I'll take a look at it. I said, no promises, but I'll take a look at it. So I get back to my office, about a week later, I'm in a meeting and my administrative assistant, Lisa, calls me and says, Chief, can you come back? I said, is this important? She goes, and it's important. So this woman FedExed me four bankers boxes of material, okay? To say she was OC would not be kind. And so, and I'm doing this pro bono. I'm gonna talk to the sheriff and I'm taking this home I'll do it on my own time and, and expense, whatever I can look. So I looked through this entire case and it was ruled by the medical examiner as a suicide. So I talked to various people, talked to the other investigators and I talked to her family members and they said, look, we're all fine with it. She's the only one that can't accept this as a suicide, which leads me to a blanket statement and the people who are in law enforcement are in here. You, you get more trouble if you're a death investigator out of suicide cases than you do out of homicide cases. People cannot accept a loved one committed suicide. So that being said, that's why I make a blanket. Don't ask me out of individual cases. I can't answer anything. Okay. Uh, cold cases. We, uh, when I was in homicide in Cincinnati, we looked at those on rather an informal basis when we were slow. We would get out a case file and there was a number of, over the years of uh, cold cases. And they're, they're always kind of fascinating to me. Uh, we solved one when I was there through no efforts of, of myself, uh, uh, really good detective work from a guy named Mike Bryan, Michael Bryan. And, uh, and one of the prosecutors did a great job. And that was, if you remember Joseph Paul Franklin, people were been around Cincinnati, killed the two young men on Reading Road, and they stuck with him. And Judge Melissa Powers was a prosecutor, and actually they went back and forth to prison to interview him. So they, they solved that case when I was there. But other than that, we didn't do really well on cold cases. And let's move to the first slide here. Cold case investigations. There's a, if you heard me on Brian, Thomas to show this morning. It's a very broad definition. What makes a case cold case? Okay. Well, sometimes it's a, it's a practicality of depending on the size of the agency of resources. They're expensive. You know, you got to look at it. Um, how much money, time, and manpower can you put into a case? Okay. Smaller agencies, it's not entirely possible all the time. Larger agencies, they can have dedicated cold case investigators. They can have a regional team, which I was, I headed up on one of my cases, um, but they are. I mean, DNA testing, that's all expensive. Travel is expensive. So a small agency is sometimes not able to do that. Not to saying the case is important. Every life is important. In fact, when I used to bring new homicide investigators on board, I'd say, you know, you're speaking for the dead. The dead cannot speak. You're here to become what that dead person was in last hour of life. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the suspect and we're looking for the victim and where their lives intersect. That is the critical time for any investigation being it's a cold case or a fresh case, that intersection of lives. That's why the original investigators timelines are extremely important. You know, uh, you got the CSI work and that stuff is all done. But the, the persons who are investigating the case, they go off in other directions. CSI work has gotten so advanced. And I, and I look at my wife, my life is a real life CSI right here, by the way. And, and I'm gonna embarrass Kelly. Kelly Best, Detective Kelly Best is a real life cold case investigator of Cincinnati Police Homicide. So they are the experts. And we assume now 
in, in particularly in the agency of the size I came from and the agency that I headed up when I was in Warren County, that crime scene work will be done completely and thoroughly. That's an assumption, okay? Because it is. I mean, there's protocols they go through. These people are really good. Their equipment's gotten better over the years. And so the investigator can concentrate on what investigators do. It starts a lot of times talking to the CSIs, talking to witnesses, and then establishing if you don't have a suspect in that night, then you're looking at timelines. Where did those people intersect? Okay. Cold cases says on the slides there, criminal investigations conducted, the original investigations have been closed with no arrest or an exceptional clearance. What's an exceptional clearance? That's a very technical term within law enforcement circles. That means we know who did it, never be prosecuted. Most of the time, the person's dead. Okay. That we had enough information, the guy is either dying, told his family, uh, or a cellmate in prisoner for whatever reason. And that's an exceptional clearance. Never bring him to trial or her, or her but uh, that's very technical. Um, generally, the time has passed, significant amount of time before the case goes cold. And basically, that's when every lead has been followed, every rock has been looked under. There's nowhere else to go. So it, it's tough. I'll tell you, the toughest thing is on the families. When you tell a family, there's nowhere else to go with your case. I'm sorry. It's not that we'll close this case, but it will not be actively investigated. You know, technically cold cases are never closed. They sit there in files and things like that. And as I told on Brian's show this morning, um, we had a guy in, when I was in homicide, he had a death uh, case set on his desk. He was 12, 14 years old. And he would look at it in his down period of time, which isn't very often these days, but it wasn't back then. And he would scribble a note or an idea, or he'd make a call, or he'd go interview somebody. And uh, when he retired, it was never solved. But uh, he kept working on it. I mean, there's some cases that won't go away. I had one in my last six months with Cincinnati. Uh, I don't know if you'll get this one or not. Xavier Williams on North Bend Road. That one sticks to me because we're pretty sure who did it. Pretty sure motive. And the family's as nice as they can be. And his sister used to call myself and Jim Englehart on a yearly basis and cry over the phone. We weren't able to solve that case. And she didn't blame us. She knew. So it was, that's a tough case. That's a tough case. And I doubt if that'll ever be solved. It's a tough, tough case. But that one sticks with me. And that's why I still, I know the circumstance. I remember being there that morning when we when the, uh, processed the crime scene. Those things don't go away easily if you're worth your salt as an investigator, okay? Uh, let's go to the next slide. Where am I, Jay? Okay. Criminal investigation, let's get, I'm gonna assume zero knowledge in here, but you gotta establish the factors of crime, okay? And then you've gotta locate somebody that could possibly be guilty of that crime. That's what criminal investigation is. You're gathering facts. Hopefully you take the court, take to the prosecutor. That's all criminal investigation is. There's, there's no more, it's no more complicated than that. Um, you know, in, in a trial, you have to have 12 people saying guilty uh, on, a, on a criminal investigation, unlike, you know, civil investigation or civil trials and things like that. So it's a very high level of proof and it's proof not beyond any doubt, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And the courts have said that proof beyond a reasonable doubt is the level of judgment you use in your own personal day-to-day -day life to say something's true. Okay, and that's, that's the very legal definition of that. Type of investigators. There's uniform, there's traffic, detectives, there's crime scene. Crime scene responsibilities, protect the crime scene. And that's everybody's responsibility. It's in Cincinnati's putting on a course now inside the tape and how to behave and how to protect crime scenes, that sort of thing. Very, very important. Um, I escorted an assistant city manager out of a crime scene one time, and he, this guy tried to get me reprimanded for it. And the chief said, there's no way, you shouldn't have been in there. How you got in there was a mistake, and you should have been escorted out. You become part of that, everything you do in there becomes part of that crime scene. You can't do that. That's hurting the integrity of the scene. Um, photographs, cheapest thing to do. At a crime scene's photograph, take tons of them. 
even better now, they're all digital. Used to even when they weren't digital, when we were still shooting 35 millimeter, shoot lots and lots and lots and lots of photographs. Because you only get one shot to do this scene is that snapshot in time when you arrive. That's why you'll see, you know, the fire department's got bloody lap sponges all over the place and compressed pads and sometimes forceps, leave it. Once the body's gone, or once the, ba once the victim has been hauled to the hospital and passed away in the hospital, it's all part of the crime scene. Photograph all that stuff. Sketch. Um, more and more that's done by laser. And uh, they have a, a system, several of them, since 90 is one, we had different in Warren County, where you do laser measurements down to the hundredth of an inch of where shell casings are, where the body is, and things like that. It does a scan and then puts that onto a printout. I still don't think it replaces a hand sketch. I, I still think a hand sketch is, is a good place to start for all that. In fact, one of my cold cases was solved in Warren County because the hand sketch that the crime scene investigator did the night of the uh, offense, drew it out when I had a suspect who has started to come around in the investigation and then we interviewed him and the interview went the right direction and he decided to tell the truth to verify what he said. I had him make a sketch of the way he saw the scene that night and you could have overlaid him. It was very powerful evidence in front of a jury. In fact, I always try to talk to juries after a case, either an acquittal or conviction. You learn a lot about the process. And they said that particular piece of evidence was very important in their minds of making this witness very believable. So hand sketches, are, I still think they're a really important thing. Um, catalog and collect evidence. And that's where chain of custody, and it's a legal term, meaning you have to know everybody's touched that evidence all the way down the line, who unseals it at the lab, who reseals it at the lab, who transports it to the lab, who gets it to court, and then the investigators have to say, yes, chain of custody. I've only seen it challenged a couple times in my career because we've gotten really good as that as law enforcement uh, of chain of custody. So there's not much uh, room for attorneys to attack that these days, but uh, that's very important. Analyze the evidence or send it to experts. Um, Cincinnati does their fingerprint analysis in-house because they have some really, really good fingerprint people, honey. And <laughs> uh, somebody who's testified in multiple states as a fingerprint expert. And uh, there's, you, if you listened to Brian this morning, you heard me talk about, and we'll get this on another slide, DNA, 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 and we'll get into that later if I want DNA. Fingerprints are the most discriminating identifying factor that you have. Even identical twins have different fingerprints, okay? So if you can bring up a fingerprint, you got some points of analysis, defense attorneys, a lot of times will stipulate on that being the fingerprint, okay? Uh, it's not a good thing to put that important evidence in front of a jury unless you have another reason. Investigators do easy to determine the crime, okay? This is tough and this is gonna tie into what I talked about suicides. We had a case one time, he was a retired physician and he was somewhat of a serious drug abuser and uh, hadn't been seen for a few days in a very, very nice condo. Um, called the uniform police, they went in and they actually I had to break the door down and there he is dead in his living room. There's blood coming from his head, his sliding glass door, which you couldn't see from the street because of his beautiful garden was broken. And there was a weight, weight bench where he had, and the, and the weight was sitting next to his head, okay? Boy, I mean, we've treated that like a, homicide, this is a crime. Well, and the next day, okay, we determined this guy was probably dead for 48 hours. Well, the next day, his credit card started being used all over downtown Cincinnati. 
So now we're, we're sure now we got a homicide, right? Corner called me that afternoon. I said, hey, Sergeant Newsom, dad died in natural causes. What do you mean? He said, he had a stroke it was compounded by his diabetic condition. And he probably thrashed around in the apartment for a while, hit his head, probably tried to go out his back door and fell into it and brought the glass back. And we had glass broken on the outside and the inside. So that was kind of a wash. And he said, but he didn't die of homicidal violence. Huh, <laughs> what about the credit cards? Uh, turned out, as luck would have it, some ne'er-do-well stealing mail from the neighborhood and went with the postal inspector and he said, yeah, we got several reports in the last week of mail being stolen from this neighborhood. It's a really nice neighborhood. And uh, went and got the surveillance film and there was doctor whatever, whatever with an 18 year old showing his credit card downtown. And <laughs> so we went to clerk and the clerk the first said, oh, I didn't sell it to me. So, well, yeah, you did. Here's your picture. There's a guy buying it. And he said, um, okay, I know he wasn't a doctor. I mean, he's only, he's only about 18. He said, but he bought me some gear on that credit card too. And so he told us who the kid was and we got him and he had stolen. So he went on federal charges, but it wasn't a homicide. But at the time we're thinking, ouch, man, all that. I mean, we put a lot of work in that for two days and it wasn't a homicide. So you got to determine the crime, okay? Locate and process evidence. Becomes particularly difficult when you have multiple scenes. Okay, you have the homicide occurred one location, the body is moved, maybe you got drag marks, maybe you got a vehicle that body was put in and then dumped. So you have, might have three or four crime scenes. That's not terribly unusual, okay? That is pain. Uh, particularly the original crime scene where the offense occurred. If you got a good whodunit murder, that can sometimes be a problem, okay? Um, locate and interview witnesses, okay? You know, that is probably the single most important thing the investigators do when the CSIs are doing their work is canvas the neighborhood, whatever they can do. What we used to like to do is stand where the body or the entrance to the place and just do a 360. Okay, somebody over there in that apartment, could they have been on the balcony? We've got to make sure we interview them. Ah, there's a mailbox. What time do they pick up the mail? Oh, I see an inquiry on that front step. What time do the inquire guy come? You know, that sort of thing. Just do a scan. Ah, security camera over here. Let's go see if we can dump that security camera. So witnesses come from all shape or form. And you really look into finding witnesses the first 48 hours. Very important. Get to them and before the media finds them. And then get their statements locked in as quickly as you can. Very, very important. Now, once you put it on the news, generally people come forward. There'll be more witnesses come forward because people don't know what they don't know. They see something on the news and they say, hey, you know, I heard a gunshot, or what I thought was a gunshot last night about 11, 10 p.m. Well, we may not have that yet. We may not have a time of the offense. So that's, that becomes, that little kernel of knowledge becomes a very, very important piece of information for us. Okay, and you also have to sift through the crackpots that come out because they want to be in, in part of a case. They want to inject themselves in a case. You also have to worry about somebody who's a suspect injecting themselves in a case. If you remember in 1997, a Procter & Gamble executive named Shannon Marks was killed up in East Walton Hills, okay? Um, her husband that morning did not have a good alibi. And I can let you in some inside football that day that we had an argument among the entire room of investigators how hard to go at him. You have a grieving husband, you have a covering up suspect. And boy, that was, we as bosses, we finally got sick of hearing all of them and sent them all home. Come back tomorrow, we're gonna start another day. Well, we had a guy on the six o'clock news, Rayshon Johnson, who gave us 
you know, you watch all the news that you're on because you want to see who they're talking to. We'd already talked to Rayshon, okay? And then he gave a statement to Channel 9 News, okay? And, and I happened to watch before we went to bed that night, Channel 12 News. I said, my wife, hmm, he changed something significantly in his statement. The truth never changes, but this guy changed something in his statement. So I kind of write my, I had a pad of paper. This poor girl went through a lot when I was working on cases, besides the phone calls and me waking up in the middle of the night and getting an idea and eureka moment, and scribbling it down. And she, what, what, she gets up, what? Now it's me, because I'm semi-retired and she's the one that gets called in in the middle of the night. But uh, I wrote it down and I got to work in the morning and one of the really excellent investigators that um, I work with, Detective Bill Couch, we were always the first ones in, in the morning, because we were both early risers, and we'd make the coffee. Nobody liked it when we were the first ones in, because we both liked strong coffee. And uh, we'd sit there and drink in our coffee, and I said, hey, Bill, did you see Rayshon Johnson on the news? He goes, that son of a bitch lied. That son of a bitch lied. I knew it. I didn't feel good about him when I was in fact. I didn't feel good about him yesterday. I said, we need to go back and look at Rayshon. And he said, I agree. So we waited for people to come in. And other people would notice the same thing. We weren't the only two. But uh, one of our deceased CSIs, uh, Sid Caesar, Clarence Sid Caesar, is a legend. <laughs> he is a legend. I mean, one of the best I had ever, ever seen in my career. Taught me a lot. He had developed a photograph that he had photographed with variable light from different angles of a distinctive gym shoe print coming out of the backyard up the hill right towards Rayshon's house, right towards it. So we found a partial inside the crime scene of the same fingerprint. It was a brand new pair. They'd just been out a week of Nike Airs, okay? There, we can only find one store in Cincinnati that was selling them. We went down and looked at them, photographed them. It was definitely the, that shoe. So later that morning, we called, we drew up a search warrant and we called Rayshon in for an interview and uh, he came in wearing his brand new Nike Airs. So put him back in the interview room and uh, he was tough, he was, he was a tough guy. While he's in there, his grandmother calls, said, I think Rayshon killed that girl. And she used the word sociopath. She said, he's a sociopath, okay? And he said, you, she got, you gotta be careful with him, okay? While one of our detectives on the phone with her, I get a call from a lady in Springfield Township and said, I saw Rayshon Johnson on the news as a witness to this homicide. Three years ago, he broke into my house early in the morning while I was getting ready for, for work. And for whatever reason, he says he didn't get, he came up with how he was confused about what house it was in. He didn't live in our apart, my apartment complex. So he got, he was found not guilty. It was a hung jury, that's what it was. She goes, but I, she says, I'd look at him. Well, we're already looking, you know, we're already looking at him. Well, um, Mac Brown, who is now a chief uh, investigator for Joe Dieters, and he's a retired Cincinnati sergeant who I helped break in, and then Mac was so much better than I was in interviews. I mean, I, there were some skills I had, but I was, I was a good interview. Mac was a great interview. He got a full confession out of Rayshon. Now, after the week that happened, I don't know if anybody was going to Playhouse in the park that night to see Christmas Carol, because it was on a Saturday night. We finally got the confession. We shut down all of Eden Park for people going up there. Had to be detoured around the entire Mount Adams because Rayshon tossed a murder weapon in the woods by season good pavilion. <laughs> so we weren't gonna let anybody come in to potentially screw up that crime scene. So if you were there that night, sorry, that's what happened. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, we had a search warrant in progress for his house while he came in to do the interview. So we served it while he was still on the interview. We do that sometimes, we get tricky. Uh, we had a prosecutor said, work with prosecutors. That's really important anytime that case was really important because it was tricky. What types of evidence? Your evidence, direct evidence. Direct evidence is mainly testimonial evidence. 
I saw him do this, okay? Physical evidence, that's what the CSIs do at the scene. Uh, they collect shell casings, uh, blood spatter, any kind of biologics, clothing, that sort of thing, okay? Circumstantial evidence is anything that, that leads one to believe a fact. Let me give you an example of what's circumstantial evidence, the best one I could think of. Um, you go to sleep at night, streets are dry, you wake up in the morning, everything's wet, streets are wet, trees are wet, everything's wet. Did it rain overnight? Yeah, it sure did, didn't it? That's circumstantial evidence, okay? That's the best example I can tell you, that's circumstantial. We all know it rained overnight, okay? Expert opinion evidence, that's what the CSIs and sometimes detectives, coroners, DNA experts, fingerprint, all those people come to bear on expert evidence. Hearsay, there are exceptions to hearsay. Hearsay is a third person hears something and testifies, okay? Um, there are some notable exceptions to hearsay. Um, there's one called a dying declaration where the victim knows they're dying and you have to inform them they're dying. They acknowledge that and then they give you a statement of who did this to them. I did it once in my career. Dr. J. Joe Hannigman came out to me when I showed up on, there was already one person dead in this case. And he said, this guy's gonna go, John. He says, you better get in there. And so we got a tape recorder. I got two detectives of witnesses. And I bent down and I said, Mr. You're not gonna survive this, you know that. He shook his head. And I said, while you're still alive, would you tell us what happened as best you can? And we put the tape recorder up and he identified the suspect who was convicted. So that's a significant different, that's a significant deviation from hearsay evidence. There's actually under the rules of evidence in the federal courts in the state of Ohio, there's 38 rules, but I'm not gonna get too far in the weeds on those. 38 exceptions to the hearsay evidence rule. Um, another, I'll give you another quick one is an excited utterance. Somebody comes running out of a building and says, oh, I just shot that guy when he sees an, a neighbor. Okay. Well, that's excited utterance. That's also an exception. That person could testify. Okay. Um, relation between evidence is proof. Evidence is the foundation upon which proof, and proof is a fact that's established beyond a reasonable doubt. So evidence is the foundation of which that sits on. Okay, you hear those used interchangeably and they're not, they're not the same thing. Eyewitnesses, eyewitness evidence is important in a criminal case. Gotta be careful with eyewitnesses, okay? The, one of the most famous crimes in American history was witnessed by over 300 people. And the suspect was discovered as a tall black male, a small white male, a heavy white male, that he had a white suit on, a black suit on, and a top hat. Who do you think I'm talking about? John Wilkes Booth. Okay. If you go back and you read some of the, it was a criminal investigation. Killing president back then was not a federal crime. Okay. It was a uh, District of Columbia crime. So go back and read that. I mean, the descriptions were all over the board for that that night from different, and there's over 300 witnesses to that. So you gotta be careful with eyewitnesses. Uh, I used to tell young detectives, if all you have is DNA or an eyewitness, you got a weak case. You better get out and get something else, okay? Now, they can, eyewitnesses can be direct or circumstantial. They can testify to a fact that's not germane to the, the part of the case that you're trying to prove, okay? Um, issues with eyewitness testimony, reliability. Make sure this person doesn't have a dog in the fight. Um, cognitive disorders emotional disorders, that sort of thing, their perspective, where they swear they are um, at the time, uh, misinformation that affects memory. There is um, traumatic things are witnessed. People filter those things into their lives much differently than your everyday activities. Um, I was on the scene one night of a very nasty shooting when I was a uniform supervisor. And we had a guy running up an alley 
and I came on the radio and I did things, directed people here, called for different people and that sort of thing that I quite frankly don't remember doing all that until um, I got the tape later and heard myself saying and maneuvering cars into position and calling for a homicide unit and that sort of thing. And um, the shots fired at the end when the bad guy took his own life. I mean, I, there was a lot of things that I did and no, and you know, I'm a trained, I was a trained professional. I don't remember doing some of that stuff. It was training kicked in. So I went, it's got to be careful. You have to be very careful with very young and I got to be careful with because I'm getting to that age. I'm lucky I remember what I had for lunch. Very old people, okay? Um, your memory starts, your memory starts to leave. Um, you know, injuries to the brain. I referee football. I used to do high school and college. I used to do high school now. So one of the games, I got knocked down between a tight end and a linebacker, division one game, and these big kids. They're getting bigger and faster. I'm getting older and slower. That's why I don't do college anymore, okay? And three of us went down, and I got sandwiched. Kathy's laughing. And uh, so I get up off the ground, and our line judge is an ER physician. So he came up and standing me up. I'm, first thing I'm doing is checking my teeth because I hit hard. And then I'm like this. And he says, yeah, I he says, yeah. So he starts doing, you know, concussion protocols on me. I said, Rob, I didn't get hit in the head. He said, well, yes, you did. You have a cut here, and it's coming down the side of your face. The blood is. And I said, oh, I don't remember that. So, uh, and I, I joke about it with my wife and kids. I said, I've had a few concussions. I just can't remember how many. So, so you, eyewitness is, is very, very tricky, okay? Um, and I put up on the slide here, usually provides an opportunity for a defense attorney. It really does. Eyewitnesses will open the door for defense attorneys. You've got to be really careful on those. You do want to get witnesses on tape as early as you can because you lock them in to their testimony, particularly a reluctant witness, okay? Um, in 2011, New Jersey was the first one. They actually created rules of admissibility for eyewitness testimony. Um, judges must weigh the risks and explain it to the eyewitnesses. We don't do quite that in Ohio, I think we do have a charge in the jury now where the judge has to explain eyewitness, which is a lot of states have done. Um, there's different ways we, we show eyewitness and lineups. We don't do many live lineups anymore. We do, you know, a photo lineup and you do arrays or you do uh, a sequential lineup, things like that, um, that you have suspects picked out from, so. All right, let's get to DNA. All right, um, me and I have a, a degree in science and DNA. I was gonna be a population geneticist until I decided to try out law enforcement. Uh, worked out okay. Um, we started first hearing about, actually when I was working in the 70s on my bachelor's degree, DNA was really under investigation then as a possible from a medical point of view, predictability of disease back in the 70s. Um, it first came about in forensic realm in 1984 in England, and I don't know the name of the little town, but they actually took DNA samples from the entire town looking for a rape murder of a little girl in this town. Uh, and that was the first time it came around 1987. Uh, types of testing, and I don't want to get too far in, just so you know these terms, restriction fragment length polymorphism, RFLP, that's pretty much obsolete now. You might find it in some third world countries because it was cheap, but that was where the sample required to be that size of half dollar, okay? All right, the newer methods don't require anything close to that. The PCR, everything is built upon PCR, polymerase chain reaction, okay? That is nothing but a uh, microbiology test on DNA. That's all it is. And DNA, um, this question comes up and I'll save somebody from asking it. What about if you get a blood transfusion? You know, does that affect if you get a sample of your DNA? Well, it doesn't because about 90% of blood transfusions in the United States are only in red blood cells. Okay. There is no nucleus in a red blood cell. 
therefore there's no DNA. Uh, the other eight or nine percent are plasma, and DNA is only occurs in the white blood cells, the leukocytes, or in, to a lesser extent, plasma proteins, okay? Um, when they run a, uh, if you donate blood, they centrifuge your blood, okay? And it comes in three layers. The deep red, heavy red blood cells go to the bottom. There's a middle layer, it's very thin, it's called the buffy layer, because the way it looks like, it's a buff color. It's a combination of leukocytes, white blood cells, and platelets. And then you have the plasma, which is rather clear on top. They save the plasma in the red, and then they use the white blood cells for research, they use them for medications, they send them off for analysis, that sort of thing. Um, I just got experimental injections of my knee to put off a um, knee replacement. Where they took they spin centrifuge and they take my platelets and they put them back in to my knee, my own platelets. And I tell you, two days, I wasn't hurting anymore. But um, so those things are all, I don't want to get, like I said, I don't get too far in, but you, you might run across it if you do further reading. Ampl amplified fragmental like polymorphism. You, you have to, to an analyze DNA, get a lot more than you got. And they have to replicate a bunch of the sample in a very, very complicated scientific reaction to be able to analyze it. And STR is what they're looking for. They're looking for the short cannon repeats. 99.9 um, .9 of all humans share the same DNA. We only differ by 0.1, okay? There's about 20,500 uh, genes in the human genome, and the genome was uh, mapped in 2003, and the predictions at a time were 50 to 70,000. We're not one of nearly as many genes as we thought we did, but we are, uh, we share 60% of our DNA with deep sea sponges. <laughs> so, and the, the creature that has the most DNA is a Daphnia, which is a sea flea, and has about 64,000 genes. Okay, so there's no rhyme or reason or what turns it on. And, and there's a thing called epigenetics where you may have the trait, but you may not present that trait, okay? Um, we have two sons. One is 5'7", one is 6'3". There's no doubt these two young men are brothers, but they have a lot of physical attributes that aren't the same. So one, why did one get height one didn't I don't know you know you know it's it's epigenetics and it's development you know twins even identical twins they may have little things different um, maybe one was on the outside wall of mom's uterus and one was lower and the difference between nutrition going down there or even sounds coming in maybe that was hap something happened in development no that's questions that can't really be answered yet but that's why, you know, we do have our unique differences. Um, the 0.1% variance is enough to distinguish one individual from another. 23 pairs of human chromosomes, okay? In 1997, the FBI did a study and decided 13 STRs, remember that, loci, loci's location, that's a gene constitute the core of variation to identity at that time, okay? January of 2017, that standard became 20 loci. So it's even more discriminating. Now you'll, you'll see in trials where the, uh, not only the, the microbiologist will testify as to the testing for the GNA, you also have a uh, mathematician come on and also explain why it's one in six billion or one in eight billion or one in 10 billion, more than there are people on the earth, that this person is related to the DNA, okay? CODIS was born after 1997, and that's where everybody submits through their state agencies to the FBI's database. It's a combined DNA index system. Uh, I don't know if they, they originally 
was a comprehensive DNA data bank, I think combined now because they went national with it. Um, there are, are a few states, believe it or not, that do not contribute. Um, but it's not a suspect database, okay? It is a database of DNA profiles, okay? There are missing people in there. There are dead bodies in there that never been identified, okay? There was a lot of suspects unidentified from crime scenes in there, but it is not a suspect database. Fingerprints, still the best, the best method of identification, bar none. Um, you ask defense counsel about that. Never proven anything to be but unique, even identical twins have different fingerprints. APHIS is the Integrated Fingerprint Identification System. It's also maintained by the FBI through the state uh, agencies, attorney general's offices, and about all branches of government, military, CIA, everybody uses APHIS. And you don't see like it does on CSI, where it comes back on the screen and it says identification and it flashes. <laughs> it, it's two things they have on those shows. They get their DNA results before their coffee's cold. Yeah. That don't happen. It's gotten better, but it's not that good. And, they, and that fingerprint doesn't say identification. It's not that. It gives you a series of suspects and classes and percentages of what who could be it, and it's still up to the investigator to match the known to the unknown, okay? Um, fresh case versus cold case. Now let's get a little bit down those weeds. Fresh case is suspect oriented. Cold case is witness, evidence, and science oriented, okay? Uh, if you heard me talk on Brian this morning, one of the cold cases we did, actually dedicated a room at the sheriff's office. We spread out every piece of evidence for a cold case we had going. It was Richard Woods. He was a furniture salesman last seen in, in uh, uh, Lebanon at a furniture store there, right as you get off 123 to go into town called Just for Living Rooms. And uh, seen there by numerous people, including the owners of the place, Sam and Debbie Perrone. And um, he and Sam Perrone had had some business rivalry over the years. And there was a lot of things that looked to Sam Perone looked bad right away. But the first crew, they did a really, really good job of collecting evidence. And at that time, that was the only homicide in Warren County that the Sheriff's Office investigated that year. And they have a lot of experience. The prosecutor's office, therefore, didn't have a lot of experience. I think an aggressive prosecutor could have taken that case to trial then, but the case became cold. And that's when we got it. There was a lot, a lot of evidence. And the evidence was all over the place because they had changed property rooms twice, evidence rooms twice, before I got the case. We had it spread out all over. Of course, we had, you know, white butcher paper, so we didn't contaminate anything. We locked it up and we actually sealed the door with evidence tape to maintain, because we, we had, did this over a period of a week. So nobody got in and out without breaking that and logging it in the book for the chain of custody. Okay, we ended up testing uh, about another seven or eight items because testing had gotten so much better in 1992, since 92. Uh, we found deer blood, because uh, Warren County has a lot of deer hunting out there. Um, and we found one particularly interesting sample that had a partial match. And the protocols had changed between 92 and 2014 when this came up. And the, the cell biologist who I talked to said, you know, back in 92, she could have testified this was a match, but not under current protocols. Because there was a, a marker called a DQ alpha that's no longer used that was, was one of the primary uh, identifications in this period of time. So they couldn't use that. So we, we did it on a circumstantial basis. We found an, a witness had never been interviewed. Um, we did a lot of media coverage. People came forward. We actually found two witnesses, significant witnesses had never been interviewed. Got them. I, I flew. I was in six states with that case. And we spent $75,000, $80,000 on DNA analysis. And it's expensive to do that. But we were committed. I, you know, I thought the case all the time could be uh, solved. Uh, I was on a stand, a grand jury stand for four hours. 
during the testimony that day. And we got him indicted in Sam Perron. And we got him getting off a plane on a business trip. These are all wealthy people, by the way, extremely wealthy people. Furniture salesman, Sam, Debbie, got enough plane in Logan Airport in Boston uh, and extraditing him back to Cincinnati. And when he was in jail waiting for trial, the I'd retired in the interim. And the detective who took over the case, Susan Horn, really first class detective, just excellent. She went in and she found one, it wasn't even listed under the Woods case, but it was in a evidence log with no notation in it, okay? Pulled that in the original envelope, had Peroni's address and Richard Woods as a victim. And it was a piece of carpeting with a drop of blood on it from his residence, okay? Guess whose blood that was? Dick Woods. Well, a defense attorney at that time could not light up the phones quick enough looking for the deal that he was so arrogant in our face about, <laughs> we're taking this trial, we're taking this trial. Well, that was, I mean, we had, we had everything else in the case. He knew it, he knew it. But in that case, the DNA was the last big hammer, although we would have got convicted in that case anyway, there's no doubt in my mind. So he ended up pleading, he's still in jail. Um, fresh face case, concerned with suspect fleeing or committing again. And that's, a lot of that is because you don't want the public to panic. We got a bad guy, we have, you know, we have, that's why you'll see, police chiefs and officials come out and said, um, there's nothing to worry about. We believe this individual was targeted or something like that. You know, it's not that you have a random um, killer going around, that's very rare. You know, one of the things you look at in a cold case called victimology, and it'll be coming up later. One of my cases, Troy Timar, who's born, burned in his trunk, really good local kid, uh, got killed by his girlfriend. I had to look at Troy's life. I had to become Troy, reading all the files. Troy as a family member, Troy as a businessman, he owned his own construction business. Troy as a womanizer, because he really liked the ladies, okay? Uh, Troy as a late night victim out at night, okay? Because he was found late at night and then the unknown. So you've got to look at different areas, okay? Quickly established through the family out. Troy was beloved by his family, okay? Same one with his friends. There was not really any of his friends. His friends were in the family were extremely cooperative in the case. In fact, I've become good friends with his, his mom and dad and his dad just passed away about a year ago. Um, but everything came back to his estranged ex-girlfriend, okay? And um, it, it just wouldn't go away for us. And we found that you always want to look in close first to relationships. You want to look in close, okay? And that, that proved to be true in this case. All right, um, fresh case, narrow, narrow focus. You think you know what you got, you got an eyewitness, you got the body right there, everything's fresh, everything's fresh in your mind. So you want to go after what you got at the time, okay? Cold case, broad focus, right Kelly? You got, there's nothing off the table. There is nothing, there's no goofy idea in the world off the table when you're doing a cold case. When you sit down with those investigators for the first time, and if you heard me on Brian this morning, it took us on the Jim Barton case about six to seven weeks to read the whole thing. And then uh, we had three teams of two and we would meet at the end of the day and this is what we read that day. We had a whiteboard, we'd write things down and then but summaries of previous interviews and things like that. And that's before we ever left the office. That was six to seven weeks. And then was before we got into the evidence as well. Um, then you, this interesting term here, solvability factors, kind of an academic firm, term in criminology. What are the solvability factors? Do you have biological evidence? Do you have eyewitnesses? Might you have eyewitnesses who are reluctant to be interviewed at the time? What do you need to go back and look at? Okay, those are all solvability factors. And those are the factors that you take um, to make the police administration interested in the case. I think we can solve this, or at least looks like we need to put some resources behind this case because those are, you don't wanna say it, but they are economic decisions after a while. 
Uh, you, can't, you can't rob Peter to pay Paul in these things. They're manpower, time consuming, they are really expensive. Like I said, I was in six states, okay? I flew down and back twice to Texas and Florida in the same day to get a, a witnesses. Uh, homicide, crimes investigated in terms of homicide, we just talked about that. Um, the accidental natural death of the doctor that I had, I mean, we thought, we all thought that was, we investigated the homicide for 48 hours. Um, witnesses, okay? Witnesses are important. You gotta get them locked in, you gotta get them interviewed. Um, when they homicides in Cincinnati, they call in two teams of two detectives and they all go to the scene, but then you usually peel off two detectives into the, to the detective headquarters to start interviews. That's still the way? You have the guy, people come in that start interviews where you still have people on the scene? Okay. Yeah, or hospitals or wherever you can find them because you want to always make two people that are staying in the scene and then you're going to go after a witness. That's how important that is. Okay. Timeline of the victim, possible. How do you establish timeline? We, you know, and I'm going to ask these rhetorical questions and answer them myself. What do you look for? Credit cards? Look for receipts? When was the last time they gassed their car? Oh, we have a Wendy's receipt in the garbage can. He was alive at 1010. He got a triple double in a frosty, you know? And then later on, you pass it on to the corner. Did he have Wendy's and frosty in his stomach? Oh, he didn't. Somebody else was here. Oh, other evidence. Okay. So stumbling in one area sometimes leads you to another. Um, I was reading Henry Lee's book in bed. Um, cracking cases. Kathy was sound asleep and establishing a timeline for Troy Timar. And one of his Henry Lee, uh, very academic book, talked about, you know, they, they had a victim and they found in his lower intestine corn kernels, because corn is very, as you all know, I don't want to get down in it, but corn is very difficult to digest, okay? They had corn kernels. And I sat straight up in bed. And I said, he had corn. And I'm right, and she, what, what? She wakes up, what, what, what? what? I go, go, go back to sleep. Oh yeah, go back to sleep now. So I, my notes that I had home, I had, I always had the, the, um, the coroner's report, the medical examiner's report. And he had undigested corn in his uh, lower intestine. So we didn't have much of a crime, a timeline until, you know, I went back and asked the, you know, the case was that time 12, 14 years old. So I asked another pathologist, he goes, oh yeah, that helps. We can get at least a narrow period of time. And that really helped us because we did not have a good timeline. Why? Because the body was burned up. Body was completely incinerated, okay? His core was, his core was okay, his bones were okay. We didn't have any DNA and nothing. Uh, we talked about it again, and I want to reiterate timelines, particularly in cold cases, can be really important. Consult with the coroner and the medical examiners. Um, we have a coroner system where you got to be an MD, DO, or DDS in Ohio. I think if you get some exceptions, or maybe a chiropractor's, but you have to have some sort of medical degree or dental degree in Ohio to be a coroner. Kentucky. I had a case down there where the guy was the local drywall salesman. He was a coroner. It was the, I mean, it's, it's elected position, but it's administrative. I mean, right, he were, carried a gun and a badge and was a law enforcement position, and, he, and he'd sign off on things that came from the medical examiner's office, which in Kentucky was all through the state medical examiners. Uh, state of Florida, the same way. They have a, a county coroner, but they have districts for medical examiners. Okay, so that's a, a nuance in the law, but in Ohio, the coroner subpoena, the coroner has subpoena power, is the, most pop, is the most powerful subpoena under law in the state of Ohio. It can take a common pleas court judge off his bench. A coroner's, investigated, a coroner's subpoena, never seen one used, but they have that power if they have to. Um, victimology, what I talked about. Troy, businessman, boyfriend, family man, random victim of crime, late night stop at the skyline, somebody cost him in the, in the parking lot, you know? That's victimology. Uh, in his case, he was a perfectionist in his job, and he was tough to work for. He was a construction, and really smart guy, construction manager, a degree in it, okay? 
and he was he he was working he was building um, for subcontractor for larger firm building UDFs at the time. But he always want, he wanted to build houses. He wanted to build houses. That was his dream to be a home builder. And he would start a project and he'd rob Peter to pay Paul. It's, and anybody's built a house and you have a private home builder, they do that all the time. You take a draw against your loan and then they pay those contractors from the last job and they're not paying them on your job, okay? It happens all the time. Troy did a little bit of that, okay? So I went and found some contractors and they said, yeah, he did that. We knew he was gonna do it anyway, everybody does it. But he was a good guy. He was always good for his money and he never lived extravagantly. So he wasn't taking money away from our pockets. He was just trying to get his business going. So we got rid of that problem right away uh, with him. And you know, that's finally, you look at everything and you go into some dark corners where you find out a little bit about his womanizing. He was a good looking, tall, model, good looking young man. Okay, his mom and dad knew he had, women would throw themselves in him. So he had to look at what? Ex-boyfriends, ex-husbands, all that. And it takes a while to find those people, particularly after 12, 14 years. People move away. You know, women get married, change their names. That sort of thing. Uh, Vicki Barton, one of our victims, um, in a cold case I did, she was a, a uh, nursing instructor, uh, adjunct professor at Wright State University School of Nursing. So 95% of her class was female at the time. Not as many males in nursing, there's some. What happens to females that are 22 to 26 after they get out of nursing school? A lot of them get married. A lot of them change their names. So trying to find them to interview was many investigations in themselves, um, scattered to the different states and to the, to the wind. Read everything. I've already, I'm gonna reiterate that again. You gotta read, you gotta, you gotta know, sometimes your, your, your thumbnail bullet points, you gotta be able to know where those are and refer to them on the fly, particularly you get a call, you get a call from somebody. You wanna be ready to go with those. Make no assumptions. Everything is on the table, even the weird, goofy uh, theories. You know, uh, there's, we came up with some really strange theories on Dick Woods. Um, he was involved in a very, how am I gonna describe this? Well, he was a gambler. I'll just say that way, and he used bookies. And he borrowed a significant amount of money from his, one of his friends to pay off a bookie. So is that something in a murder or a homicide cop probably wants to look at? Mm -hmm. eh, yeah, look at that. Yeah. So you got to go into dark corners of people's lives sometimes, and that can be uncomfortable. Um, I got 100% cooperation from his widow and her present husband. Uh, they, they just they wanted this case solved. Her present husband actually knew dick and um, so I mean you just got to look everywhere in that sometimes it's not pleasant it's uncomfortable at times confronting people um, we had an indication that he may even have an affair we had to trace that down and that's a hard thing to confront a wife did you have any evidence of this it turned out he wasn't but there was enough people who thought that he was that we had to close that door and interview her and she was shocked. I mean, there was no way he, and you know, at the time we didn't know, we didn't know. It turned out that, that it, it, he wasn't, but gotta go down that road, gotta go down that road. Um, you gotta bond with the evidence. Literally, you have to, every piece of evidence, like I said, I already talked to the evidence clerk when I was in Warren County. I said, is there anything else in this Woods case that we can test. No, no, no. She was relying only on everything entered under their Sam Perone's name or Dick Woods' name in the evidence files. She didn't rely on the dates. And when it was all over, she said, I learned something. You know, I should have ran the dates going back, starting that day and going forward in several months to see if something was unaccounted for because that piece of carpeting with Dick's DNA on 
it was on there. It was clearly on there. She just didn't find it. It's just a mistake. Okay. And I probably made a mistake too. And I relied on people that I should have gotten the logs myself and look at that. Okay. Luckily it was preserved well enough that we were able to test it because uh, DNA is not terribly stable. Uh, sunlight and chemicals. Um, we had a suspect. This is an interesting case. We had a suspect in a, in a cold case, the Barton case. We're pretty sure to this day he was, there was two murderers that he was number two. He was involved in a vehicle pursuit with Middletown police, went on to AK Steele's property and drowned in a retention pond trying to get away. And they didn't find his body for four days. They wonder what happened to him. Turned out he tried to swim in this retention pond. Steel plant, what do you think's in that? What do you think's in retention ponds? Very strong acids and bases, and it's like a chemical mix, right? So he was such a mess and so bloated. They put him in a body bag and shipped him off. They didn't even open him up to funeral home and buried him, okay? When he came, he became really strong as a suspect. So we wanted to exhume the body and went, met his family one night. The, and his dad said, absolutely, I won't stand in your way. So we exhumed the body, okay? I've done that a couple times in my career. It's a court order. Um, the dead have no reasonable expectation of privacy. You really don't have to have the family's permission, but it's really, a lot more clean if you do. So we brought the body up. We took all four teeth that were left in his head and he had a rough life. And uh, which are usually a good place in the roots to get DNA. We took from six different sites, you know, your, your long bones are a great place for DNA. Well, being he was in a retention pond for four days at a steel plant, it was all denatured. Every bit of it was denatured. We got no nothing that we can make a profile on. And, and I remember when we got those results back, I was watching the National Geographic that night and they brought a Roman soldier up from a well in Northern England that had been there for 1800 years and they found DNA in him. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so we got the family together after that and we said, well, he's got two sisters and his ex-wife and a little girl. So we can test them. This was a nice blue collar family. He was, he was the black sheep of the family. They were nice people. We got all together. My tech, one of my detectives and I went over there, met with the family. Um, so we're gonna test the two sisters, dad and his little girl. Dad takes me in the kitchen. He says, he ain't my son. His mom had an affair. She confessed it to me. He raised me like my son. Nobody in the family knows. Okay, your secret's safe with me, sir. <laughs> we'll take the DNA and go through the, the whole rigmarole. So, so sisters didn't work because they weren't his sisters. Because hmm. mom had died and daddy got remarried. So that didn't work. Little girl. So we're taking a little girl Ex-wife mom takes the other detective aside and says, ain't his baby. <laughs> we were separated. I got pregnant at the time. That's not his biological kin, but he came back and we raised her as our little girl together. All right, so it was a good night. So it's just uh, one for the books um, when we talk about that sort of thing. Meet with victim, family, friends, business associates. You know, things change over time. And it's done with current cases. It's really done with cold cases. You look for an ex-spouse or an ex-significant other. They're great for solving cases. You know, they just, they want to talk and talk and talk sometimes. You know, stuff that they've been holding back for years. Yeah, I'll get that son of a gun. You know, and <laughs> I got him now. And uh, you got to be careful, but if you can corroborate what they tell you, uh, you look for those pretty quickly in the investigation, actually. 
but relationships change over time. Uh, in the Dick Woods case, we had a lady who was uh, going through a divorce at the time, and she saw something very significant the day of the, the, day of the murder, and it didn't, it, because of all the turmoil in her own life, it didn't register in her what she saw until we, she saw the news story that we did, that I did with Deb Dixon, who's now retired from Channel 12, about anybody saw anything at this area at this time, and she called, and her memory was amazing. And her uh, piece of information, she actually saw the victim and the suspect behind his business arguing within 15 minutes of the last time we know he was alive. So that would have been brought up in trial if he hadn't have pled. And she, she came about, I mean, that's, things change over the years. We wouldn't have located her if not for that news story, if not looking back into it. Nothing changes besides the relationship of um, the significant others and the spouses is neighbors move away, particularly inner city. They're afraid to come forward in the inner city as a witness. Oh, wait a minute, they're living in another city or another area. Yeah, I'll tell you what I saw. That happens quite a lot. Um, and, and it's very important, very, very important. That's why even if you think a witness has got nothing more to say, you need to go re-interview witnesses. That's, that's been a benefit to me more times than I want to tell you. Hey, John. Yes. We're running a little tight on time. I just want to let everybody know they, people can ask questions. Great. I want to, I think, yeah. but does anybody have any questions they want to get? John, can we ask a, could we throw a sure. couple questions in? Absolutely. Okay, great. Here's one right in the front row. Yeah, I got a couple of questions for you. Uh, DNA. Yeah. Uh, well. From DNA, you can identify the case where they were looking for. They were looking for uh, a certain race, and then and the DNA guy said, "You're looking for the wrong race." And uh, identify the guy's color of his eyes. Um, I mean, yeah, race, race is not, not really well established in DNA. Um, color of eyes can because a certain race has certain, it, it's not anything that would be good at trial. It certainly may be developing a suspect, okay? But you gotta be careful in those areas. As far as uh, animal DNA, yeah, they have tracked, the guy had dog blood on him. Well, it's a victim's dog. He was shot too. I mean, that's happened. Uh, my wife had a case of leaves in a car and went and got uh, a, and get a DNA workup on the leaves. They never used it at trial, but they found that, that that leaf was from that tree and close to where the victim was last in line. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, that's all out there. Yeah. The other thing I had was, uh, let's see if we're still getting out. Uh, Other questions, please. Uh, say, uh, methods or tools to commit murder. There were roughly 70,000 deaths due to narcotics overdoses in 2017, and firearms deaths were running about 14,500. 14, uh, two parts to this. Has um, narcotics overdose by hot shots per, uh, with fentanyl in particular kind of replaced firearms as a means of uh, committing no, murder. No idea, not my area of expertise. And the other part of it is, is has the medical examiner's or the coroner's uh, conclusion of accidental overdose shut the door on a number of murder investigations where hot shots were used to bump off the uh, victim? Same answer, I don't know. I'm just too far removed. I've been okay. semi-retired, so yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Georgian. I have a question about the Patty Rebholtz case. Yeah. Green I, Hills? The Green Hills case? Yes. I'll try to answer. I, I, I was a kid when that happened. Of course, I remember it. <laughs> I wasn't a kid. Uh -huh. I just wanted to know, um, Michael, Michael Waring was, I guess. Yeah, they brought him to trial. Right. Yeah. So they retried him. Right. So my question was, was that considered a cold case? They still had the 
clothes that he was wearing, they still had all of those, that evidence. Yeah, I, I'm so, not familiar what, what they took for the grand jury and what they presented at trial in that. I know they retrialed Michael they retrialed Waring. And, yeah, um, he was a strong suspect back then and he remained strong suspect, and, but they just found not guilty. Right. So, I mean, it, yeah, that would have been a cold case. Sure, that was what, 30 years, 35 years. Yeah, so. Can I ask a question real quick? John, could you talk about um, kind of the, the whole husband, it's always the husband um, when you're investigating a murder or um, and your feeling on that? When you walk in the door, I mean, if you see, what are you, what are you thinking? Well, we men tend to be, we tend to be physical, hands-on people. Um, you do want to look in. You do want to look in close on domestic situations. In Ohio, we don't have to prove motive, but you got to be careful with motive because you really don't know what goes behind in a relationship in the behind the four walls of a relationship. You don't. So you got you play fast and loose with that. And motive can direct you towards a suspect that sure isn't going to solve a case because there might be 10 people with motive. If you got really a, you know, a nasty guy, you know, look at the, all the mafia hits in New York, you know, the motive was easy there, but the motive for Joey Knuckles versus, you know, um, I mean, that, yeah, yeah. You, you always look in close. Um, alibis are very important at that time. So, and solid alibis, because alibis can be shot. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, what percentage of murders are actually solved? Well, in, in Cincinnati, we did an incredibly good job. What's about 60 to 70? Yeah, 60 to 70. When I was a homicide supervisor one year, we didn't have many homicides, we sold them all. We There's a question right here. So. My name's Carl. I've been trying to find the answer to this question for years. Why in Cincinnati, if somebody passes away, do they always dispatch the police? In other jurisdictions, such as Kentucky, if somebody passes away, they'll send out the ambulance. The ambulance drivers will pronounce the person deceased and perhaps call the coroner. In. Different structure of, the, of state law. Um, you can't, only a physician can pronounce death, okay? And in Ohio, and I assume it's the same way, and you can help me, when I was there, we were ex officio investigators at the coroner's offices because they couldn't, they didn't come out all the time. We would talk to the coroners by phone with permission to, to haul the body. This is what we got, okay? Because if you have, there's unattended deaths, death of, of, a, of a juvenile under the age of seven, there's a, there's a whole categories of things in Ohio that have to be investigated, okay? Um, you know, you don't want to assume something until the coroner tells you what it is. And there's another caveat to that, though. The old cops used to say, don't tell the coroner too much because they, you don't want a coroner to form their, their analysis about what you said. That happened a little bit recently, the death of the infant in Warren County. They told the, the forensic uh, too much about what had happened at the crime scene, shouldn't have done that. You know, um, they should have let her give them the scientific analysis unfettered by what you told them, so. May I ask another question? Certainly. If, if someone has information about an old cold case, who should they contact? Is, should they try to contact that jurisdiction? Find, find that a jurisdiction, that's, that's the best place to start. If not, local prosecutor or district attorney's office, Commonwealth attorney, if it's in Kentucky, that sort of thing. Uh, one thing that, that I was going to quickly mention is psychics. Psychics come out of the walls when you got a cold case or even a case. We had a psyche in Cincinnati when I was there. She had on her little business card and website that she assisted Cincinnati police. And my boss gave me her card. He got her card somewhere. Says, she called here. Assist us in anything. She says, oh yeah, she said she told you where the crime happened, a particular crime that we had solved. And I said, yeah. She said it was near the river and railroad tracks in Cincinnati. <laughs> That's what she contributed to the case. And she's going around the country and putting these seminars on. Yeah, I said Cincinnati police. That's ridiculous. 
And I'll say one, one psychic, I said, how come you're only in sensational crises and murders? Why don't you know who broke into the Pogue's vault back in 1973 and stole all the diamonds and furs? How come you don't know that? No answer. So. We got another question back here. Yeah. Um, reading in the paper, uh, it's the anniversary of uh, Vegas, Mandela Bay shooter. Yeah. Uh, I know this a little outside of Cincinnati, but uh, any opinion on that as far as, uh, do you ever see that being solved? Uh, everything I read on that, everything goes to a dead end. Wh which? The shooter that shot uh, from Mandela Bay, he all shot All those people? 50, yes. What do you mean solved? I mean, it, I, well, it just that they really don't know, I guess, motive. They don't know motive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why I said you got to be careful with motive. I mean, um, most states, you don't need to prove motive. Motive is a tricky thing, particularly when you're talking the mind of a, a madman. Amen. And that's a scary place in there. You, you know, motive is tricky. I mean, they, that case is closed. They know who the perpetrator was, but join a shadow of a doubt. Here's a question right here. Yeah. Oh, Kathy is my first name. Do you ever meet with resistance in, in researching a cold case oh, yeah. or yeah. politics? Uh, Vicki Barton's case, Vicki Barton's mom. Uh, we always thought she knew something she didn't want to tell. So we, we handled her with kid gloves. And when she finally went to her house and she said, after all these years, what's it matter? After all these years, what's it matter? Your daughter's dead. Your daughter's dead. We're reopening this case. Well, we think she suspected her son-in-law and she loved her son-in-law. Their son-in-law was the son she never had. Vicki was gone and he did everything for her. Took care of her grass, her dogs, her house. And I mean, yeah, we had a lot of resistance in that case. Uh, we didn't put her on the stand because of that. Hey, and, John. Yeah. It seems like um, when any, when, whenever somebody wants, they want to get DNA fast, it can be turned on a dime, but then there's always, it takes forever. So how long does it really take? About a day if there's a push. Is it more, do they charge you or do they? No, it just depends on the significance of the case. Um, you know, it, it, and it depends on what, how much resource, um, you know, the, I know one of the SEALs who was in on the Osama bin Laden raid. Mm -hmm. And they had his DNA about three and a half hours after they landed at, in, back in Afghanistan. Um, they had, because they wanted to make sure they had, and they were ready to go with all that analysis right then and there. And does each municipality get charged for the DNA processing? Yeah. How much, how much does one cost? Um, I don't know what it is. I know you do it on a, on a week, on a yearly stipend. And I know at the coroner's office now, and it's, cause that's part of her budget, cause we're all Hamilton County residents. Okay, but in Warren County, I con we contracted with Montgomery County Crime Lab to do our DNA and some contracted with the state, things like that. And when I was chief up there, it was about fifteen, eighteen hundred dollars $1,800 per. Last question, then we're gonna let you finish your last couple slides, okay. okay. Okay, as you were going along here, I just happened to think about, uh, I wouldn't consider it a cold case, but uh, the uh, shooting that took place in Vegas yeah. with all those people, I think it was 58 that died and there was hundreds right. that were wounded. And they still don't know what the motivation was of this person. Was he a mental case or oh, yeah, and, clear you know, now we're going to be wor worrying about red flags and taking guns away. And, you know, our I encourage everybody to come to the Empower You next Thursday to learn about red flag laws and about how every one of you red, red flags could are not, run into trouble. We can't legislate this issue um, away. We just can't legislate the issue away. Okay, no. we're gonna let you finish up real quick, John. Okay, okay, thank you. I don't think we have much more. Um, decision to move on to cold case, the strategies developed, investigators, corners, prosecutors, executive leadership. You gotta bring executive leadership in because if the funds roll, you know, I, I was signing checks for this stuff when I was chief, okay? But when I wasn't chief, I was presenting to my bosses, plus the corner, plus the prosecutor, asking them all for bucks to keep this going. That's why executive leadership, they are expenses. They are expensive. They are very resource intensive. Um, you meet with the prosecutors constantly. We did uh, literally on the phone with them when we were on our cold case team and usually every Friday morning because it's really hard to get attorneys on Friday afternoons. Uh, legal advice becomes very critical at this point. Uh, 
your complete and detailed report eventually submit a prosecutor's office for consideration grand jury. And that's your only job as a cold case investigator, get it to grand jury. Um, I've had some cold cases go over the report of investigation, as it's called, which is basically a summary of everything that's germane to the case, it was 11 pages. And in the case of Sam Perone and Dick Woods, it was 55 pages. So it just depends. It just depends. And that's it. Let's thank our guests for tonight. Great. John, that was great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Appreciate thank you. you coming. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just a couple things before we let you go. I know John will probably stick around for a couple minutes. I'm going to ask our operations manager, Jill Google, to come forward. She forgot to get her award tonight. So, Jill, could you come on up? Let's give her a round of applause. Um, she is an empowered citizen. And uh, Jill helps me with so many things. And this is Jill's creation, our new Betsy Ross uh, oh, flag, cool. which is incredible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's thank her for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jill. And we're going to let you sleep in tomorrow, Jill. Um, so I'm also tardy putting the first two classes up online uh, where you can watch the recordings. The recordings are getting better every year. They'll be up tomorrow, let's say by the end of the day. And every day, about 24 hours after the Empower You class, if you missed, if any of your friends missed tonight's class, they could just watch it on, watch it online, and it's it's really a great thing. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.